like to welcome you today to today's telecast of True Hope for Today. We'll be continuing uh, this week with uh, our study on the book of James. We were working uh, on James chapter 2, verse 24 in our last telecast, and, uh, and that's uh, James really gives a really draws it out to try to show everybody the uh, justification versus, you know, faith and being saved and not saved and uh, the good works that result from that. So James said that uh, kind of, we kind of, finished up our last telecast where James had said that uh, the, come to the conclusion that the answer must lie within us. Rather, the uh, good works which justify us according to James must be as Jesus. So they do not lie within us. Uh, Jesus answered uh, The work of God is this, to believe in one he has sent. This is because when a man believes in me, he does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. You know, our continued faith in Jesus after saving faith in Jesus becomes a work, not a work, but the work of Jesus. We believe in have faith in Jesus' earthly ministry and are justified, as Paul says in Romans. Our justification in what uh, we do then, according to James, must be our reliance on Jesus' works. His continued work on our behalf as a mediator between God and man and the future promises which we wait patiently for. If this isn't the case, then... As I said above, we're in a never-ending cycle of wondering if our uh, works are justifying us. Even though Paul says we are already justified, by necessity it must uh, all come back to Christ. This is even confirmed by James when when he said, You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, okay? And his faith was made complete by what he did. Paul states in uh, Romans 4 uh, that Abraham was justified, declared righteous by faith, And then he uh, cites uh, Genesis uh, 15. But 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 James in the quote above cites Genesis 22. Seven chapters and many years after the declaration of righteousness made in Genesis 15. The Genesis 22 account, which James referred to, is explained in Hebrews 11, verses 17 through 19. So by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, and Isaac, your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Do you see uh, Abraham's faith? By faith, Abraham was made complete by what he did, by demonstrating uh, faith in God. This was the very work that James is citing. The deed is uh, the faith in God's provision to bring Isaac back from the dead. From first to last, our declaration of justification is from and of Jesus Christ what he did on our behalf. Our works of justification, our faith in him, and the works he is accomplishing. 
and will accomplish on our behalf. The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. You know, one argument against this could be that James, uh, in, in most of chapter 2, is talking about actual deeds of righteousness. Two examples. What good is it if my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If, if one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. That's James two fourteen through 17 that we were going through. Counter-argument, uh, James gives a tangible example of food and clothing, but then turns to say, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. However, no action is specified. We've already determined that the action required for justification is faith. Our faith justifies us through and through. Second, likewise, was not Rehab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? In James 2.25, counter-argument. The Bible says Rahab's faith is what saved her. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Uh, Hebrews 11.31 but Romans 4 debunks any thought of boasting before God based on deeds. You know, take time to read the entire chapter, uh, chapter 4 of Romans, uh, and understand what it's saying. Understand that it fully supports what is presented, what we just presented, in the matter uh, presented concerning faith versus deeds. Listen to others. Evaluate what you hear, and above all, verify what you hear against the only correct standard, the Holy Bible. To say that justification leads naturally to good works, and that they uh, therefore prove salvation, discounts uh, biblical examples, which are cited, you know, which we cited above. And it also leads to a never-ending cycle of wondering what works count and which don't. Rather, all good things come from Christ, belong to Christ, and are necessary or are by necessity a result of what he alone has done, is doing, or, or will do for us. You know, have faith in him and his salvation, and you are secure in that, in that alone. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written. The just shall live by faith. Romans 1, 17. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Romans eight thirty. In the, in this same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and, and sent them off in a different direction? From a previous note, uh, you'll, you'll know that it was by faith the prostitute Rahab because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. By faith, she was saved. The faith justifies. The deed is merely uh, an attachment to the faith. You know, many attempt uh, to climb high mountains, but the lack of motivation uh, to ever reach uh, the summit will often outweigh the physical ability to do so. You know, some will uh, turn back without accomplishing their task. In contrast, uh, those who truly desire to reach the summit can do so. 
even if they have a far even if they have far less uh, physical strength than those uh, who couldn't make it. Those with faith they that they can that they can do it well, they'll they'll prevail. Okay, you know we often quit a task uh, because we don't have faith in a positive outcome. Those who do, uh, even with uh, fewer resources, they'll continue on and be successful. The outcome is attainable, but the faith is vital. In Matthew um, 17, Jesus' disciples couldn't heal a boy uh, uh, that had a demon. And Jesus rebuked them by saying, Oh, unbelieving and perverse generation. Later, when they asked him uh, why they couldn't drive out the demon, he responded, because you have so little faith. I tell you the truth. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will be moved. Nothing will be impossible for you. The outcome then was possible, but they lacked the proper faith to bring it about. Uh, Rahab had a um, saving faith in the God of Israel. Her words indicated this. When we, uh, when we heard of it, our hearts melted and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. You find that account in uh, Joshua 2 verse 11. You know, Rahab understood the omnipotence of the Lord and put her trust in it. Today, if you're facing uh, a difficult situation, remember that God is in complete control. Have faith that what he's plan is sufficient to accomplish the task according to his will and for your best interest. Let's look at verse 25. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? From previous notes, you'll, you'll know that it was by faith the prostitute Rahab because she welcomed the spy, was not killed with those who were disobedient. By faith, she was saved, the faith therefore justifies. The deed is merely an attachment to that faith. My Bible app uh, disappeared on me, but we'll go back and we'll start to uh, pick up uh, with James 2.26, and it reads, As a body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. As it says in Ecclesiastes 12.7, uh, And the dust returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. When our spirit uh, departs, our body dies. People have actually tried to weigh the spirit. But what did the body weigh just before and just after death? You know, this is a little goofy, but it shows that people are truly searching for what happens to us when we die. Fortunately, God has already given us all all the information we need to know for what happens at that moment. It's only faith in what he says that may be missing. Likewise, uh, just as our uh, body is dead when our spirit is gone, James says that our faith is dead when deeds are missing. Previously, I explained that even our deeds are to be of faith. In other words, deeds... Without faith are dead, just as faith without deeds is dead. 
The two are inseparable and all point back to the work of Jesus Christ in the life of the unbeliever and in the life of a believer. If you've acknowledged um, Jesus Christ as Lord, then your deeds are, are to continue to trust him and have faith that your life is being directed by him to a good end for you. Any actual working, uh, workings of deeds are to be done in faith that they are a part of his great plan in your life. Just as Abraham offering up Isaac was, just as Rahab's faith in the God of Israel was, and just as was the case in every faithful figure, mentioned or remaining unmentioned, but remembered in Hebrews 11. Yeah, heroes of, heroes of uh, faith are those who live intimately connected to the Spirit of God and who exercise faith in all they do. Are you a hero of faith? Do you honestly trust that the immense trial you're facing is for a good end and a glorious purpose? What about the annoying things that happen throughout the day? Have you come to realization that even these are molding you for your good and for his glory? You know, walk in his spirit, trusting that what transpires is just as it uh, should be. Old child of a living God, just trust that things are transpiring just as they should. Let's move on to uh, chapter 3. And verse 1 reads, Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that uh, we who teach will be judged more strictly. You know, having a proper understanding of the Bible before teaching ought to be the norm, but it appears to be the exception. Very few ministers and pastors can truthfully say that they've read the Bible even once. Bible teachers will often use non-biblical texts for Bible study, They'll quote a uh, purpose-driven life, uh, the Life Behind series, or one of a number of non-biblical texts, as if they were authoritative for successful living. If you want bad doctrine, just click on the Internet and type in Bible study. There are millions of sites containing such bad information that it's simply impossible to discern what's right and what's wrong without already knowing what the Bible actually says. Is it okay to drink alcohol? Only one answer is correct, yes or no. But without having personally studied the issue, how can you know which is true? What should be the truth about Christian giving tithing or something else? What does tithing really teach anyway? The list is, uh, is long of such lesser issues which lead us down faulty paths and which sets our lives on unhappy courses. Now, how much worse than uh, with the great issues such as justification by faith alone, by grace alone, by scripture alone, through Christ alone, and, and glory to God alone? Consider other major doctrines such as the Trinity, the virgin birth, the resurrection. If you get those wrong, your salvation is probably in question. And yet there are millions of people who either deny these fundamental truths or don't know where they stand on the issue. If the masses who aren't teachers are in trouble, then how much more the teachers as such stands Misdirected faith is wasted faith. You know, make sure you read your Bible and know the truth eternity waits. Verse 2 says, we all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. You know, living a faultless uh, 
road is a hard challenge. And as James indicates here, we all stumble in many ways. There are certain sects and cults which uh, claim that uh, we can have total victory over sin even in uh, this life. But 1 John 1 verse 10 dispels that notion. It reads, if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. You know, we can't claim that we were or are yet free from sin and to make such a claim is to call the inspiration of scripture into question. However, we can be faultless in the use of our tongue. And this in turn uh, will allow us to keep the rest of our actions in check as well. You know, James uh, will spend a lot of time discussing the tongue in the lessons ahead because of a larger amount of effort he dedicates to the subject. We demonstrate wisdom to take heed to, the, to his admonitions. In addition to um, James, the book of Proverbs deals uh, with the subject of exercising care in the use of our mouths. Together, let's make a concerted effort to use our mouths for praise and not for cursing, adoration and not contempt, uplifting and not tearing down. If we do this, not only will uh, those we address be blessed, but we will be as well, we will be too. Negativity in life stores up in our souls and makes us bitter. So let's attempt to focus on the good aspects of others to the extent possible depending on the person. If there's nothing redeeming in the person, then don't say anything at all. Why lower yourself to the level of a debased person? All things uh, to the glory of the Lord. So let's watch our tongues closely. Verse 3 says, When we put... Uh, Bits in the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. James is uh, coming to a point, so we don't want to uh, preempt him. But let's, uh, let's go back and see what he was talking about. First, not many uh, should purpose to be teachers because teachers will receive stricter judgment. Second, uh, we all stumble in many ways, but if someone is never at fault in what he says, he can keep his whole body in check. He must be, he must be relating his point about the horse to point two then and applying it to teachers. Just as watching a small uh, part of our body can lead uh, to positive effect on the whole, so a bit in the mouth of a horse can make this large animal turn where, where we want it to. Watching our mouth then is an important aspect of our lives in any situation, but as a teacher, it's even more so. You know, parents who don't watch their tongues around their children are going to have children with evil mouths. Teachers who uh, flippantly uh, talked about misguided subjects will only produce misguided students. And Bible teachers and pastors who make faulty uh, analysis of biblical passage are, are going to produce students and congregations with faulty doctrine. If you don't think this is so, just uh, give, your thoughts, uh, give your thoughts on any touchy subject from a biblical perspective. Either it's acceptable or, or it's not acceptable. But what... But what you were trained is what you believe, regardless of what the truth is, okay? Now, go do a study directly from the Word and check it out for yourself. Without presupposing the outcome, continue this pattern uh, with every doctrine you learn. Don't, you know, don't blindly accept what you're taught. Your teacher is uh, more responsible, but you still bear responsibility in the matter. We're just going to touch up on verse uh, 4 today. We're just about out of time here. But let's go on ahead and uh, 
read verse 4, and that's probably where we'll, well, it will be where we'll pick up in our next telecast. But James uh, 3, 4 reads, Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. So imagine the massive size of modern ships, larger than football fields and able to carry cargo loads more immense than most of us uh, could believe. And yet they can be steered by a rudder at the back of a ship, which is small in comparison to the size of them and their load. And then add in the strong winds, which push against the gigantic sides of his ships and the waves which beat down the length of them, and it astonishes that uh, they can keep a true course at all the way, the way to their remote destinations. Now think on the even more immense direction of souls steered by a wayward preacher or leader. Second uh, Peter uh, one twenty one says, For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Uh, we need to uh, stop, and we'll pick up there in our next telecast. So until the next time, may God bless you and keep you. Thank you. I'm Dr. Timothy, Senior Ministry Leader, inviting you to learn more about us. Our message is that the Lord Jesus Christ is mankind's only true hope. Now, what makes True Hope Ministry somewhat unique is our mission, which is to help you do what God has called you to do. Each member of True Hope shares in this commitment of helping one another uh, in their respective endeavors of what God has called them to do. Now, beyond what's typically offered by ministry fellowships, the greatest resource of True Hope Ministries is what we call ministry companionship. Now, ministry companionship is simply the members of True Hope Ministries investing in the success of each other within our fellowship, plus we encourage our ministers to also meet opportunities to invest into the success of other ministers in their local church communities. Ministry companionship is based on two primary principles. First, that by the Lord's giftings and our own ministry experiences, each of us holds pieces for the success of others in ministry. And second, those ordained in ministry service, especially leadership in ministry, should not mean becoming spiritually and emotionally isolated. Yet so many in ministry suffer from this very malady. You know, as adverse conditions, even aggressive actions against the church increasingly develop in America, ministry servants and leaders of ministry cannot afford to be without genuine ministry companions. If you or someone you know in ministry sees the need for ministry companionship, please visit our website. And you know, we'd be so glad to talk with you, so give us a call. The call is toll free, and if I can't answer your call at the moment, please leave a message because I promise I'll return your call just as soon as I can because I really do look forward to helping you do what God has called you to do.